And yeah, let's get the session started. So welcome back, guys, to the Personal Finance Weekly Sessions. Today, we have a fellow Ziggler, Cheryl, Sherry, and she'll be sharing about her personal journey in finance, alternative investments, and her startup, Blue Jay. So thank you, Sherry, for volunteering to share, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, having me here. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Sherry. Um, I'm a Zoogler, like I'm sure many of you here. Um, I was born and raised in the U.S., but I came over to Singapore with Google in 2018 um, after three years in Mountain View um, doing MBU and strategy and ops. Um, I was on the payments team for uh, about three years, um, basically part of the early team that launched Tez, which later became Google Pay for India, um, which was a pretty fun journey. Um, and then I left and uh, started my company in 2021 um, in the height of the pandemic. To, in, in the height of the pandemic. Um, and so uh, I guess uh, maybe I can talk a little bit about my own personal finance journey. Um, so I guess from a very young age, um, you know, my parents kind of ingrained in me that building wealth was something that was very important. Um, so just like many other, I guess, families that emigrated to the U.S., um, my parents didn't really have um, a whole lot to begin with. So they always tell me they came over with just the clothes on the back and two suitcases. And I remember they even shared with me as an adult that at a certain point in time when it was, you know, my brother and I and them, um, in Chicago, where I spent some of my childhood, that they had less than $1,000 in their bank account. And so it was really important to be able to cultivate not only just saving habits, but around, but um, investment habits to kind of build that wealth over time. So, so that really was quite ingrained in me. And I, I remember um, even my, you know, from a young age, my parents would talk about the stock market and everything at the dinner table. Um, and then I guess my first, uh, uh, it was actually within my first um, job um, at Amazon. This is one year before Google that um, I had a really good first manager who uh, was kind enough to kind of take all of us new grads, stick us in a room and teach us about personal finance, right? This is not something that was really taught in university classes, right? I, I went to Berkeley. There was, I took a lot of corporate finance classes. I, you know, studied business and everything, but there were not that many I guess, uh, topics or conversations around personal finance itself. So um, that was actually my first manager at Amazon that, you know, sat us in a room, taught us about what a Roth IRA is, uh, ETFs, um, why you want to be able to diversify across multiple stocks instead of, you know, try to invest in a single one and hope that makes it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was, uh, I think, you know, really good to have that kind of mentor in life. Um, but of course, from there, uh, you know, I put all of my, you know, first savings for my for my job into a Tesla stock. So I took some of the advice, but then went and also uh, did a bit of a um, investment then, but which, which did end up paying off. I would say that that's probably one of the ones that did end up working out, um, you know, aside from the more, I guess, uh, passive investment that is, is normally recommended. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think uh, what I was kind of, uh, what I kind of followed as, you know, personal finance um, advice for a long time was that, you know, you can put money in the stock market into S&P 500, into ETFs, um, and uh, generally things would kind of work out. And, and that was primarily the case, right? And, um, of, you know, in the 2010s when when I when I started working, right? Because that's when uh, the, the the stock market was always doing well, right? You, you almost could have put your money anywhere and it would have done well um, during that time. So uh, I didn't really think much about changing up my strategy or thinking that there's anything I had to change about a portfolio that had pretty much 96% allocated towards equities. So this was company equity plus, um, you know, public stocks. Um, until 2022 happened. Um, and, you know, the environment really changed. Um, the the interest rate environment, I guess, in the 2010s was was almost like this anomaly in history, right? And um, essentially, like a lot of people who have tech stocks um, heavily weighted towards equity, um, my entire portfolio value dropped 20%. Um, and uh, that's when I really started to look at options, right? For what can I do to you know, weather through different conditions, right? This is the first time that's really happened for me. And so that's when I started to look at um, alternative um, investments um, and seeing what is potentially available out in the market. 
Um, I know I just, uh, you know, talked a lot, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I, I do want this to be a lot more interactive, um, uh, you know, with any uh, questions um, from the audience or from you, Nitbin. Yeah, um, if anyone has questions in the audience, feel free to raise your hand. I'll call on you, but maybe I could get started first. So, I, like you mentioned, um, from young, you had that background. Your parents um, taught you the importance of investing and eventually you got into it. But let's say that someone has always been around the concept of investing, but never really got into it themselves. Do you have any recommendations for them and how they should get started, why they should get started and what their journey would look like? Yeah, um, so I think you know, there are more resources than ever right now to learn about investments online, right? It's actually incredible, right? I, I, I still think about like how, um, you know, back in the day, like you kind of had to tune into the, the radio, right? There's a lot of like more, um, I guess uh, there were a lot less media, right? That you can actually consume to learn about investments, right? So so, so the information is is out there and it's available, right? Now, um, not all of it might be, you know, tailored to particular, maybe uh, to your particular, um, you know, needs or interests or perhaps even your level of understanding or financial literacy, right? I think that's the um, curating or figuring out where to go for that is, it, I think it's a bit more difficult. Um, so like how, how to get started, right? I mean, I, I, my approach is always to go with people, right? Okay. Um, I, I, um, I was lucky enough to, I guess, at the age of 22, I, I was, you know, I, I basically just went to my manager and was yeah. like, Hey, um, what should we do about our, you know, salary coming in? Right. Like yeah. what, what kind of advice do you have? So yeah. really, I think relying on the people around you that you think are financially savvy and just sitting down and ask, asking them what they do with it. Right. Um, I think, is one way. Now, of course, um, it's important to recognize that um, everyone's situation is different. So what one person says might not necessarily be the case for you, but I think it is good to hear, you know, multiple different perspectives. Yeah. Um, the second piece of advice I would give is, um, you know, there's no better way of trying out uh, a certain type of investment but just trying it out, right? Yeah. I think um, there are enough platforms where you can invest like pretty small amounts and just right. see how it does, right? So um, maybe I'll give an example of like how, you know, I, I got into alternative investing, which is um, yeah. basically anything that's not public markets, right? So it's not stocks, it's not um, public bonds, et cetera, but it's actually, um, you know, uh, investing into uh, structured credit, which can give you um, fixed yield returns, or I guess even, I guess more exotic, some people could even you know, be, a, uh, be a, you know, an LP into a hedge fund, et cetera, right? So, so these are like, you know, somewhat newer ways to invest that are not commonplace. I think that you can just try out by, you know, investing no more than maybe an angel size check. So it's like, um, you know, $5,000 or so. And just, um, you know, it's not money that if you lose it, um, yeah. it will you know, break you hopefully, but then yeah. because you put money in, it's like tuition, right? It's like you're now following how this does. And then you can right. kind of dial it over time. So when you're trying out something new, I would say never put in too much because you want to build your own, you want to tailor the amount of investment and allocation uh, according to the amount of knowledge you have about that mm -hmm. particular, that particular asset. Yeah. Um, and then I think the third thing is, um, I mean, I think investing is really important, right? I think, um, and again, this is not, um, it, it's, uh, it's kind of funny because, um, there's still a lot of people I talk to who think, um, financial literacy or personal finance is about saving and, um, budgeting, right? So, mm. um, how do you spend money at the, with, with the things that you want to spend money mo the uh, most with, or, you know, when you're putting money away, you're putting it into a savings account and, and that's a plan. Right. But, but the thing is you don't know yet you're losing money every single year to things like inflation. Right. Yeah. So um, investing still protects you against that gradual loss of value of money over time. So it, it is incredibly important. Um, and the second thing about investing that is really important is it, it really is one of the I call it like infinitely scalable ways to build wealth, right? If you think about how you build wealth, it's really, you know, you work and you receive a salary or you put money into something and that grows, right? But you are always going to be limited by the number of hours that you have in a day 
to work a job and earn a salary from there. But your investments are actually infinitely scalable in the context of your own time as well. So it is another avenue to be able to build that over time. So um, investing is something I think that I really wish was uh, like a honestly a course in primary and yeah. um, or it's just personal finance or right? in general is yeah. a course in primary yeah. or um, you know high school right growing up I think that's almost as important as you know some of the other classes that we take um, mm-hmm. and it's something that everyone should find a way to be able to learn and um, you know learn and be able to apply to their own lives. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent agree. Financial literacy, I think, is very important, but most people don't get it, unfortunately. And even though they have basic financial literacy, they might might not know how to diversify their portfolio. So going down that line, and I think Stuart is curious as well. Maybe let's yeah. talk a little bit more about alternative investments. I understand you have um, experience with credit investing in specific, but yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about that. What got you in? How did you start with credit investing? Why credit investing? And what other types of alternative investments do you know? Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, maybe let me define alternative investments. Um, so basically, they're they're usually within um, the private markets. Um, usually, uh, slightly uh, people want to invest in privates usually because it provides um, either some kind of like uh, risk reward alpha, if you may, um, above what you can see in the public markets or provides you, um, you know, uh, investments into interesting areas, right? So it could be anything from, um, you know, investing into a fund like LP into a VC or doing an angel investment. Um, You could also classify uh, whiskey investments, investments into art as also alternative. So so these are just non-standard ways that people can um, invest in an asset class. So so, so that's, um, you know, that's kind of the whole broad range of alternatives. Now, um, when when it comes to what I have done, um, I would say I've been actually incredibly boring when it comes to alternatives, right? So I basically was looking at my portfolio and saw that I was very um, heavily equity weighted. Um, and what I wanted to um, add to my portfolio was fixed income. So something that is going to generally produce, you know, eight to 12% interest per annum that isn't super volatile, right? So it doesn't really move. It isn't really correlated with the movement of the rest of my portfolio. And so that's really where um, credit or private credit kind of fits into that category. Um, so for, for those who don't know what um, private credit is, um, it's it's a term uh, broadly that applies to um, funds or companies that do non-bank lending um, to different uh, to different companies, right? So generally speaking, these are going to be uh, mid small to mid cap companies, but even larger companies have actually been going to the private credit sector versus going to the banks because they can potentially get better rates. Um, now this has actually grown um, quite a bit in the last. Um, 10 plus years just because of the global financial crisis in 2008 that just made it much more restrictive uh, for banks to do lending. Um, and then furthermore, as uh, you know, bank banks in general are lending at uh, much higher transaction sizes at like 100. Uh, and I think in Asia, it's about generally 50 to 100 million is the transaction size for most loans for companies. So if you're like a, you know, cash flow positive um, you know, medium sized business, um, but you just want to, you know, borrow for short term capital need, uh, short term working capital needs. Um, it, it's a lot harder to perhaps get that from a bank. So you may want to go to a credit fund um, to 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 get that kind of financing. And so um, this has actually um, been growing among the family office and institution circle on private credit as an investment class, just because in this um, particular interest rate environment, you are getting um, double digit returns uh, with basically collateralized debt, right? So you have some kind of um, safe, uh, almost like covenants and safety measures in there for investors that you don't even get from equity based financing. So, so, so this is, um, and this is what I, I have been doing, right. Um, in, in terms of, uh, diversifying my portfolio into alternatives, right. It hasn't really been into the more kind of fancy exotic stuff, but more around just diversifying, um, you know, from pure kind of equity based, um, investing, um, have I looked into algo trading? This is from Stuart. Um, so I am not really a big trader. Uh, so I, I um, 
you know, just like a lot of people in 2020, 2021, um, I thought I was a very good trader in crypto. Um, so I, you know, I definitely was part of the whole kind of mania that happened, um, you know, during those two years where there were just so many um, kind of very dynamic opportunities to um, get involved in, uh, I guess, buying certain tokens, right? So um, I, I did do some of that during that time. Also, we were stuck at home. So there was, uh, it was kind of a way to keep me occupied and also meet a lot of other interesting people as well. Um, but I would say in general, um, that's uh, trading or uh, trading at a higher frequency is not how I've kind of decided that, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not how I've decided to you know, formulate my own investment strategy, right? So I, I think I'm more of a, a buy and hold type of person. So, um, you know, in general, uh, I've been mostly keeping my portfolio in kind of the lower risk stuff, which includes ETFs. But even when I am, you know, I guess buying an individual or taking an individual bet or buying an individual stock or token, um, I'm holding it over a long time period. You're not doing too many of them. So, um, to this date, uh, I really bought just, I think, under five individual stocks. Uh, I don't really trade them. Um, this also includes the Tesla stock I bought back in 2014. So, um, yeah, so I don't I don't do too much of the algo trading side. But again, I think that depends on who you are as well. Like um, I like to. Uh, generally keep my portfolio in the lower risk stuff, but if there's, you know, 10% or 20% that um, where I, I think that there's a interesting directional bet to take, um, I'll hold that for a very long time. I'm not really mm. like buying it to sell right away. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm curious and it seems like others are too. Um, you mentioned you're slightly on the lower risk side, right? But how do you pick who to invest in and Mark asked a similar question, like other index instruments like the S&P 500, where you can just invest and forget about it, or do you have to individually yeah. go and pick who you oh, want? Oh, no, I, I put a ton into the S&P 500, just to yeah. be clear, right? So I, I have it in, um, again, I'm, I'm a weird person where I like to make sure I don't put all my money in one platform, but um, yeah, I have a, 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 a bunch of different kind of index tracking um, ETFs. Um, okay. So uh but do yeah, alternative so, investments or credit investing have that same kind of uh thing? Like, do they have ETFs as well, or how does that work? No, they don't. They don't really have ETFs today. So, so basically, um, so a lot of these you have to get through um, get through certain platforms. And and let me explain this, right? Yeah. So, what um, what many people had to do to get access to uh credit funds or to alternatives before is to know a buddy at a fund call them up, ask them for allocation, and then maybe you can do it with 100K or 250K, right? And and maybe if they're really good friends with you, they can give it to you for 50K, but that's very atypical, right? Um, but what has happened is there's all these like tech platforms that have actually emerged that make it easier for um, an investor to invest, uh, you know, 10k 20k right into into the, these asset classes and you have to do that through those those platforms you can't call up those guys at the fund and hope mm -hmm. that they take your you know 10k okay. check size right yeah so, so um uh generally that's where uh i guess as an individual um if you're you know doing a smaller amount that's that's how you would um access it oh okay um as dot asked um are there any platforms that you recommend in specific that you have used personally yeah, so um, in Singapore, there's a there's a range, right? So I, I'm just going to recommend Singapore because uh, I, I actually haven't been doing this as much in the states. Um, so for uh, private equity related investments, um, there's uh, two big ones, uh, Adex and Alta Exchange. Um, they're pretty similar, um, but they'll have kind of different range of um, funds that you can find on there. Um, when it comes to credit, uh, there are two that um, people are actually there's, there's three that um, are people look at. There's um, there's valid as Helicap and then one called funding funding societies. Um, I think the third one people normally consider more of like a P2P lending platform. So it's a bit more into like uh, small businesses directly. So, so you're like lending to like a fishery in Indonesia. But um, what I we can get through at least the first two is have have a bit more of a diversified portfolio of these debt instruments. So so what I mean by that is when you're um, 
when, when you are investing in credit, instead of it going to an individual business, that's actually going to the balance sheet of that um, of that player. And then they are then distributing those funds across multiple different companies. So, so it becomes a lot more diversified. So if any one of them, God forbid, has a default, right? A worst case scenario, right? Um, that is a very small percentage of that overall portfolio. So your overall position wouldn't be affected as much. Mm. Uh, plus a lot of times these instruments are a lot more secured, meaning that if there is a default, there's some kind of backstop that's available um, as well. So um, I generally would recommend doing something like that um, instead of doing uh, P2P into a small company. But uh, just to note, I did not say this in the beginning, but none of this is financial advice. This is just my own opinions and my own experience with some of the platforms. Um, and then yeah. I, I guess I have to mention the final one. I mean, I, I, my, um, so I actually built a company after Google uh, that is operating in this space. Um, it's called Blue Jay, um, and essentially uh, what we are doing is uh, we we are a platform for alternative investments, but we are partnering with um, as many interesting uh, credit opportunities in Singapore that give you that kind of ten percent fixed return um, on credit. Um, and I'm making it much more easy for investors to be able to invest in it at uh, check sizes as small as um, 10K. So we're aggregating across all these different opportunities. So you don't have to go to each individual one, KYC, do the whole AI check and everything. Um, we want to bring those best opportunities, curate them, um, and then aggregate all of the funds for them from smaller investors and also provide a way for you know people to um learn about these asset classes um, and uh, also learn from each other as well. So we do a lot of kind of, uh, you know, educational sessions, webinars, uh, community-based events for Blue Jay as well. Yeah, awesome. Okay, um, Chris asks, uh, which are your current yeah. five, um, I assume, uh, <laughs> that you invest in? Uh, sorry, this is, um, sorry, I'm just trying to pull up the chat again. Um, like, oh, so like, what am I currently invested in? Yeah, I assume so. Tesla yeah. was so awesome for you, Sherry. What's the next Tesla? Yeah. It's not financial advice for football. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, I. Uh, so my my next. So one of my buys and hold buy and holds right now. Um. Is actually again, please. This is not financial advice. Um. I, I'm holding Ethereum. Um. Because I still am a really big believer in crypto over the long term, especially in the ten year horizon. Um, having spent time um, in payments uh, and understanding um, how uh, the infrastructure that powers finance is very much kind of pieced together and, uh, you know, from, from all these legacy systems, I see a lot of promise in blockchain as technology, right? After having spent a lot of time in it post my, my time at Google. And so overall, like I am very, very bullish about crypto in the long term, even though there's a lot of short term volatility. When I say short term volatility, I'm not talking about day to day. I'm talking about cycles right within, you know, two, three years as well. Um, and so I want to hold a position or express my kind of um, belief of the market in a certain way. And so actually a large percentage, um, almost all of my crypto holdings today actually are just in Ethereum, um, ETH. Now, um, people will ask, like, why do I you know hold uh, uh, Ethereum, why not? Why not Solana? Why not Bitcoin? Right? Um, no, to me, Ethereum um, is a really interesting one because not only is it one of the biggest market cap uh, major cryptocurrencies, right? Which generally means that it's you know more likely to stick around than you know some of the other ones. But Ethereum is uh, was the first uh, smart contracting um, uh, a smart contract based platform, meaning it wasn't just a layer for um, you know, transaction uh, for, for transactions to happen between um, different wallet holders, but actually um, Ethereum was uh, the, the, the first blockchain where, um, you know, people could actually develop decentralized financial applications, meaning it, you can actually build um, a trading platform, a decentralized trading platform on Ethereum. You can build uh, borrowing and lending protocols. So you can do so much more. You can basically, pro it's like programmatized money, right, essentially. So um, I believe in the ecosystem, a lot of Ethereum. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I hold right now. Um, it's, uh, I've kind of uh, let go of most of my other uh, crypto holdings outside of that and just kind of put it all in one and just hope that, you know, it, you know, uh, pays off the same way as Tesla over a 10 year period. So I'm not planning on selling that um, portion of my um, portfolio at all. 
Um, and of course, you know, the second thing I have to mention is um, I still hold a lot of Google stock, right? I mean, uh, after uh, after 2022, I, I did really have a think about how I wanted to, well, you know, what I wanted to do with my company stock, right? Because um, I did not sell anything for a long time, right? I was, you know, holding it. Uh, I worked for Google for six years, right? I think, um, you know, I, I just been, hold, I was holding my company stock um, and uh, only sl- uh, recently I started to diversify a little bit. Um, just again, applying the principles of, you know, having a, uh, having not too much concentration risk, right. In, in, in my own investments, but I still hold a pretty large percentage of my own portfolio in Google. Um, and not just because I'm too lazy to sell all of it, but I still really do believe in the recent kind of bets that Google has been taking. I think it's going to play an extremely meaningful role in the future of AI. Um, and so in a way that's how I'm expressing that kind of, um, I guess that, that kind of, uh, that I have on the future um, within Google as well. Um, I mean, other than that, I everything else is in kind of the safe and uh, safe and passive category, right? So, um, I mean, I'm continuing to uh, hold what I've held in ETFs. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm also, uh, you know, whenever I, I build up enough, kind of. Uh, my own kind of cash savings when I have some extra, I'm, I'm putting that into fixed income. So that's been my, you know, allocation strategy um, as of late. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, the, the Sherry top five right now. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, um, maybe going back a little bit back into uh, credit investing again. Um, I was wondering at what stage of someone's investment journey should they start to look into diversifying their po- diversifying their portfolio? Because you know at the start you it's very easy to get overwhelmed by yeah. number of stocks, funds, ETFs, all these words on your head. So at yeah. what stage do you think is a good idea to diversify? I think it's a good idea to diversify at all stages, but how you do it is different, right? Mm-hmm. So um, there's a general principle that. I mean, look, the younger you are and, the, you know, the earlier, uh, you know, the earlier you are in your career, you do tend to put uh, a bit more in uh, higher risk, higher growth, because you have, you know, many years ahead of you to, to, to kind of work and build your wealth. And then, of course, the closer you are to retirement, then that, you know, scale kind of goes a bit more on the lower risk side of things. But um, I don't think at any point in time, there's no diversification at all, it's just more around what that percentage is, right? So, um, you know, I, I I joked about putting all my, you know, salary and savings from my salary in Tesla stock when I first started working, but I did, you know, set that, that wasn't a hundred percent of everything. I mean, um, I, I, I think, uh, I still had a percentage that went into, um, you know, ETFs and something a little bit uh, more tracking the the S and P five hundred, right? So, so I think, um, you know, you can dive, you can start diversifying. I mean, pretty much at, or I think it's a good idea to generally diversify at any point in time. It's just, uh, you know, how much you allocate to each really can depend on your life circumstance. Um, the other way to look at it is, is to think about what your your goals are, right? Um, now, everyone's personal finance goals are incredibly different, right? Some people have um, certain net worths they want to hit at a certain age, right? I mean, it could be a, just an arbitrary number, but it's just like, I, I want to be worth this much at this age. And it, that's what I think is um, financial freedom, right? Mm. Other people, it's more around, um, you know, uh, certain goals, right? So a, a very common goal is, um, you know, when, when you're kind of maybe your, uh, early mid career, right. Maybe more on the early side, you want to buy a house, right. That's like an aspirational purchase. So you think about saving up for that, that purchase for that house. Um, other times, um, it's also, you know, once you're, I think the way you think about financial goals, uh, can change when you become a parent as well. So then it's, you know, really about perhaps saving up for certain milestones for, for your kids as well. So that's another way to think about it. instead of having, you know, a specific number target for financial freedom or whatever that goal is for you, it could also be for, you know, certain big purchases where you want to have those funds available. So then you kind of work backwards, right. To, to make sure you, you construct a portfolio from there. Um, people do work with financial advisors to figure this out. Um, I personally have not actually really worked with them because I just did it my, myself and just consulted 
uh, my mother, uh, who d- is pretty savvy at investments, and then other people within um, my circle that I think are good at finances. Um, and it's, it's worked out okay. I mean, I think, again, this is just, you know, I, I tend to like to have a bit more control over that. But I think, um, you know, that is something you also could go to a financial advisor for to figure out um, what works for you. Um yeah, I hope that answers the question. But I do think that diversification yeah. is important at any stage. Um, just figure out what your goal is, and then what is the level um, and uh, how much level of risk, right? You're you're kind of willing to take to get to that goal, and then right. yeah, yeah, awesome, yeah, great answer, honestly, yeah. Um, Mark asks, um, what indicators do you look at? Um, that makes you pause at your position or reduce your position outside equity. So I guess what he's asking is what indicators make you want to change your outlook of the market or the stocks they're holding or the private equity they're invested in? Yeah. Um. So, I mean, so g- generally speaking, um, I mean, I, I do tra- track and follow the, um, you know, where kind of interest rates um, are, are going, right? Because that has a pretty major impact on the performance of different asset classes. So um, just as a, a maybe an example, right? So um, when, when, when looking at the credit space, um, pretty much the interest rate that you receive would be kind of risk-free plus a premium on top. So in the 2018, 2017 era, actually investing into credit uh, would yield much lower uh, returns, right? It was yielding maybe like four or 5%, right? Today, that is at 11%, 10%, 12%. So it's like, uh, it's so much higher just because the, the, the risk-free rate has, um, has risen quite significantly. So that that's one that, um, again, um, I do follow. And um, generally speaking, there, there's, there is a bit of a lag, maybe by a couple of months, but where you kind of net out with those kind of investments really depends on where risk-free is sitting. Um, and then of course, uh, it does have an impact on equity markets, both in terms of public as well as uh, private as well. So I'll talk about the private part because maybe that that could be interesting. So um, for those who are, who've ever angel invested or, ran a startup or plugged into the startup ecosystem know that um the the how 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 high of a valuation startups get when they raise money or how easy it is for them to raise money really depends on the interest rate so there was a time in 2020 20 2020 to 2021 it was just kind of I would say like madness for the bull market, right? So everything was doing well and it was very easy for um, startups to walk in with a deck or one pager. And as long as they had a good background, they got funding, right? That is absolutely not the case today in 2023 when it comes to fundraising. So um, in in a way that there's a, even for, uh, I, I guess for, um, uh, for for some companies, right, they they have to raise even flat or down rounds from the previous um, from from the previous few years. So so what that means is because money isn't as cheap, there's not as much venture capital being deployed into startups. Um, it's a lot harder to kind of grow and push up that valuation. So if you're a you know an angel investor or you're an early investor in in, in the startup, um, maybe if you were doing it from you know 2018 to 2020 or 2021, that period, um, it was a lot easier to kind of get maybe a three X on your investment or, or more, right. If you had, if you had ability to to do an exit, but in in this current environment, that's a lot more difficult. So, um, you know, that does come, uh, as a, as a factor of that, that kind of interest rate environment. So, so that is one that, um, I mean, I, I, I track, I mean, there's the, the meetings that happen out of, out of, uh, the U S that impact basically the rest of the world. So, yeah, so that's, um, that's one. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Pooja asks, um, what platforms do you use for Ethereum investments or do you do it directly? Yeah. So, so there's multiple ways to do this. Um, so, uh so typically when you buy crypto assets um you either buy them through a centralized exchange um or you can buy them through a decentralized self custodial wallet like metamask um so maybe i'll explain the centralized exchange one because that's actually more common um so uh, what is a centralized exchange uh, that basically means like a 
you know, uh, Coinbase or Binance um, or uh, in, in Singapore, there's uh, also CoinHako, some of the local ones as well, where um, you can actually directly transfer money from your bank um, fiat um, into the exchange and then um, buy uh, ETH, BTC, any number of those assets. Right. And so, um, you know, why would you find a solution? What, what, what's good about the solution, right? Um, I think number one is that it's fairly straightforward as a user. Ex uh, the, the user experience is very straightforward. Um, you also, uh, you know, can directly transfer from, you know, your yeah, fiat cash into the exchange. And then, um, yeah, so, and then you don't have to worry about self-custody, meaning you don't have to worry about, your private keys or, you know, some of the other things that um, are like, again, a little bit more difficult to use when it comes to just purely using like a decentralized wallet in, on, on Ethereum or on, on um, I, yeah, on Ethereum, other, uh, other blockchains. So um, yeah, that, that tends to be, I'd say like 90% plus still the volume for, for crypto trading and crypto buying today. Um, now the downside of a centralized exchange, um, are a few fold. I think number one is that sometimes the fees are really high. So you do have to check what that is. So um, on some exchanges on certain assets, you might be paying as high as like a hundred basis points, right. For a trade. So that's 1%. And so, uh, you know, th those add up really quickly. Um, I think the other downside, again, this really depends on, I, I guess, your personality as well. I think uh, some much more crypto native people don't like centralized exchanges because they don't actually get, you're, you're not, you're not theoretically in control of your own money. It's it's custodied by a centralized authority, right? I mean, or a centralized um, player. So uh, again, um, it depends on the trust you place in that centralized player, right? Um, so if you trust Coinbase, you think Brian Armstrong generally is a you know good leader, upstanding person who doesn't want uh, who who is trying to do uh, be a good steward and do well good by the users, and maybe you can you know, you might trust that more, but then there might be some centralized exchanges where that might not be the case, right? And so um, that's, uh, that could be a concern. Now, um, for those who want to be in more control of their own funds, you can actually buy Ethereum and other crypto investments using MetaMask um, or other uh, decentralized wallets. And so uh, what decentralized wallet basically means is uh, there's not a central authority that controls that wallet. It's it's really you, right? Um, so, but but the thing is, if you lose something like your private keys, right, that, that's individualized to the wallet, um, you could lose your funds, right? So with greater uh, con with greater autonomy also comes greater responsibility. So that's a trade-off that you you constantly have to make in crypto, which is which is not always easy, right? So it feels like um you have to pick like the lesser of you know, basically like you have to, you have to constantly make tra trade-offs, pick the lesser of two, um, yeah. potentially, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, lesser of two evils in a way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what do you think is going to be the future of this credit investing? Do you think in the future on TD Ameritrade, I could invest in credit or I could invest in other, all the, all the investments? Do you think that will yeah. happen or... I, I think it certainly will happen, right? I think um, it, it's it's not easy to change this overnight, by the way, but I do think that the uh, the industry is starting to move um, towards that direction. So, um, and, you know, just to share, right? Um, I think uh, a couple of the big asset managers like KKR and Blackstone have already started exploring, like um, distributing their products more towards, uh, I guess, retail investors, right? Uh, or private investors. Um, so there are a few different, I guess, opportunities that have been launched already. Now, uh, how inclusive they are, I think really does depend. I think when they say smaller ticket sizes, it still might mean $1 million um, instead of the $100 million that you have to put in as an institution, right? So, so they are moving into that direction because they're realizing that um, now, private capital is actually one of the uh, biggest opportunities in like the next couple of years, right? Um, just, just, as, just as some numbers, uh, I think private wealth as a percentage, uh, so the the people, private wealth within uh, one to 10 million of net worth. So sometimes you classify this as like mass affluent, right? Or like it is H&I, but it's not UH&I. This formulates one tenth of the world's assets under management, right, currently. But it's extremely underpenetrated when it comes to privates. It's mostly in public markets today. Mm -hmm. So um, large asset managers, institutions are kind of waking up to this, but um, it's going to take some time because um, there are still... Uh, 
I would say new distribution channels that need to be built up for this, right? It's a very different kind of, I would say, customer outreach distribution channel to be built when you're talking to uh, retail investors versus institutions. There's a lot more, again, education that is required as well um, and, and awareness building. So um, I do think it's a future. Um, it'll just kind of take some time to move towards that in the next couple of years. Mm. That's quite interesting. Uh, Do you think there will be a future where they will fractionalize private markets as well, like private equity, like angel investing? Is there a future where they might fractionalize that? Um, I mean, in a way, angel investing is already fractionalizing VC, right? I mean, I, I guess fractionalizing angel beyond the way it is. Uh, I mean, you you can you can there's there's ways to invest like basically a a thousand dollars, right? Uh, mm -hmm. through angel list through to to different startups. So in a way, that's um, I guess. That's already fractionalizing, um, you know, the the venture asset class. Um, and there's there's also a you know a bunch of different platforms. I don't do this myself, by the way, but there's a bunch of different platforms where you can invest into fractionalized real estate as well. Mm, um, yeah. So you, instead of uh, you know having to uh, again, real estate is highly illiquid and high minimum ticket sizes, but then you can actually get a smaller proportion of it, maybe one tenth of one um, through these platforms. So uh, it's, it's already happening, right? It's just that we're not at the stage of mass market yet, right? I think it's like, um, you know, probably like 2% or less, maybe 2% is generous of, of people who qualify for these kind of investments are actually making these kind of investments, right? Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, the, the uh, I would say the investing behavior of people are also changing to kind of drive more interest in some of these like more exotic alternative asset classes. And that really does come from, you know, partly the I guess the, the new generation's way of thinking about investments as well. I mean, I, I, I find a lot more people who just want options, right? They're, you're, you're no longer like, oh, what have my parents been doing? Or what does my wealth advisor tell me? Or what, what has been done over the last like decades, right? And, and I, that's what I follow, right? There's so much information today to find out about different ways of investing. So there's a pop popular Reddit forum um, in Singapore where actually there's people that just talk about, hey, I have... $200,000, where, where do I deploy that money? Or, um, you know, what what are different CPF investment um, uh, ideas, right? So I, I think with this new age of like um, kind of information sharing on the internet, new ways of connecting with people to talk about this, um, people are looking outside of just what has been, you know, tried and true, right? And so yeah. I think that will build more and more popularity for these alternatives and the fractionalization opportunity comes in because it makes it easier to be able to invest into these alternative asset classes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, another question I have is when you're investing in stocks, a very famous saying is uh, time in the market beats timing the market, something along those lines. Right. Yes. So do you think um, it's true for credit investing as well? Because credit investing is pegged to the interest rate kind of like it's yeah, quite, yeah. Closely, quite closely. So do you think that rings true for credit investing as well? Yeah. Um, Yes and no. But, you know, I think with credit investing, the, at least the stuff that I've done has always been more short term. Right. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not looking at anything more than like six to 12 months. So yeah. generally speaking, um, I'm only doing this when I have a view that the market won't change drastically within that time period. Right. And so mm -hmm. and, and again, the, the, the point of doing it is also it's a fixed return investment. So right. um, in general, uh, your time in the market uh won't change like the returns that you're getting the same way equity investing works, right? Because equ equity again is your 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 you're buying and selling and you're yeah. hoping to get capital gains there. So yeah. so that, that does matter. So you know what I will say is time uh timing of the market is more important for credit than time in the market for the most part. So you you I mean can look at uh basically where interest rates are today and then compare what you would get from you know a uh, I guess credit investing versus um you know how much that would be in basically ETFs today right and uh if you looked at 2022 um and you looked at private credit and looked at the S&P 500 credit actually vastly outperformed right um just cuz S&P was um I mean it dipped but it was also extremely volatile so 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 timing of the market is very important for for credit whereas time in the market maybe not as much just because you don't really get that same kind of capital appreciation that you get from investing in equity. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's very interesting. That 
you know, it's reversed. Um, I guess we could move on to a little bit more about Blue Jay. You mentioned it previously, but I'm really interested on who is it for maybe first? Why should they use it? And then we can go on to run these question after that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so um, I built Blue Jay after uh, after Google, um, essentially for people like myself, right? That wanted, um, you know, the ability to invest in more options when it came to investments, but wanted to do it at smaller ticket sizes, right? Because I wanted to follow my own advice. Don't put everything into something that's completely new, but try it out. And then over time, kind of build your allocation towards that asset class. And so um, what BlueJay is, is a investment platform that connects um, accredited investors to um, credit investing opportunities. And so uh, what we a lot. So, you know, historically, investors have had limited access to this asset class because of the ticket size limits, because of information access, right? You might not have a buddy to call up at a fund to find out about this. Um, so we, we kind of solve for that information access by curating and showing different opportunities to invest in it in Singapore and allow people to do it as at, at as little as, um, you know, $10,000. Um, now, I uh, the type of people that have been on the platform thus far are actually very much people like myself, right? Because again, it's a, I'm solving a, a little bit solving a problem for myself, but it's a lot of people that, um, again, um, come from, you know, tech backgrounds or they're, you know, exited founders, or they're, they're kind of looking at different options, um, to, to invest their money outside of just equities, right. Uh, which has been maybe the majority strategy for the last decade or so. Um, and then are a bit more inclined to use a tech platform versus just go through a private banker, right. Again, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a, maybe a behavior preference. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, on the on the uh, fund side of things, we've started partnering with different uh, credit funds and fintech players uh, here in Singapore. And uh, generally speaking, all of the different opportunities are on the fund level. So it's not like individual, it's not P2P lending, right? It's not into an individual company, but actually you're working with a professional uh, who does credit for a living, constructs that portfolio, um, knows how to underwrite um kind of uh, underwrite and structure products for these different companies and then uh, work with us to make something that was institution gated for, you know, family offices and, you know, uh, uh, funds, make that available for accredited investors. And uh, they like working with these funds, like working with us because, um, you know, they're, they're not, you know, their, their bread and butter is, is the structuring side, but really it isn't around uh, reaching out to private investors, yeah, right? Because distribution, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Distribution. And again, it's the same logic of why, um, you know, platforms like angel list exists, right. Or I syndicates yeah. exist, right. You, you kind of build almost a, it, it, in, in part, it is like, uh, yes, you're functionally kind of aggregating things together, but you're almost building a community around investing in this as yeah. well. So um, different people can actually meet each other, learn about this, and then also, um, you know, then participate in different fund opportunities together. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned that um, it's currently only for Singapore. Um, is that right? Do you have plans to expand into different countries? Um, Pooja asked if they, she can invest from India. Yeah, yeah. So um, it so we focus primarily on Singapore uh, from a go-to-market perspective, and all of the different funds that we have are Singapore-based, but you actually can't invest outside of Singapore. Okay. Um, that is um, the, the way that, um, yeah, so, so, so that is possible, right? Uh, 90% of our users are in Singapore, but you know, I'm, I'm American and I've been, you know, I've been across different parts of the world. I have people ask from Europe as well. So, um, it is, it's definitely possible. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, connect with anyone afterwards if they're curious about learning more about it. Um, you know, happy to chat. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Randy's question is actually very interesting here. So he put up, I think, an article where they say 150 portfolios is better than yours. And it seems that it's already case that um, um these portfolio, uh, these companies are making these portfolios that already have these alternatives. So what is the future for that? Like well, if if I yeah. may speak, if, yeah, yeah, that's please. Okay. yeah, yeah. So basically, with the with the regular EPS and ETNs already out there, without going to these alternatives, it's uh the kinds of portfolios you can come up with, and each of every one, each and every one of them being diversified in a different way, is already mind boggling. So with all these alternatives coming in, it becomes even more mind boggling to design a portfolio based on a person's desired risk profile. It's probably more than one way to do it. There's more than one way for a portfolio to suffer losses in a different season, so to speak. If we you know speak in the four seasons mentality um so how yeah. 
how how do investor individual investors make sense of this outside of of help and and you know maybe a technological platform such as yeah. a robo investor might be helpful so do you see you know where do you see robo investors going given the rise yeah. of these alternatives is is my question thank thank you nitwin as well as well for for you know asking this yeah yeah no problem yeah i i think this is an incredibly interesting question and you know you know i you know, I'll give this little plug, right? Um, there's these guys called Art of Finance that uh, are ex-Googlers actually as well. Um, they're my former colleagues on the pay team. Um, and uh, what they've created actually with uh, Arta is um, almost like a AI-based kind of digital family office. Um, essentially, they, they have like a wider swath of products, right? It's not just privates, but it's actually publics as well. And I think they have something called a an AMP, uh, AI managed portfolio as well, which functions a little bit like uh, if you were to take a bunch of Bridgewater Associates um, hedge fund analysts and then, you know, create something that, uh, you know, is similar to that, but um, uh, run by AI, That I think that's similar, right? So, so I think that there are going to be new solutions around this. Um, I, I don't know too many in the market today uh, that I think, uh, spans across everything, right? Like I think most of your robo advisors are just on publics currently today, um, but doing it on privates, uh, I haven't seen um, as much or public and privates. There, there's another company, I'm, I'm slipping on the name, but I, I can send that to you um, later on. But in the States, there is one, uh, uh, one company that is doing a alternative investing I think indexes or basically they're they're almost like a fund of fund strategy. So they're basically instead of like Blue Jay where we have a platform with a bunch of these opportunities, they're kind of uh, taking in people's funds into like a bucket like credit, right? And then they're allocating them across like ten different funds, and it's like kind of done with that. like you just deposit once as a investor, and then um, th those funds kind of get invested on your behalf, right? So in a way, it's like indexing across multiple of these different funds. Um, so, so I think there's something like that. There, there's something like that in the States. I, I'll go try to find that name, but in Singapore, not yet. Right. There's, I don't, there's not really anything that is, I've looked at almost everything, right. There's not something like this just yet. Um, is that a direction that we may want to move in the future? I think it is possible, but, um, you know, I think initially it's, uh, about kind of curation. And then the next step is figuring out how you can actually pull that together in a much more automated way. But I do think that, um, you know, Robo advisors platforms um, have a big opportunity and role to play in, you know, almost like in a real time, smart, uh, holistic portfolio diversification strategy beyond, you know, what you have seen, you know, maybe thus far from even from your from maybe human to human interaction, which again, is not as real time, right? You can't call up your, you know, your, your financial advisor every single day, right? Uh, and um, having it much more holistic across all of your asset classes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because that's that's what I'm seeing you doing, except you're doing it manually, right? Interest rates go up, you go into, into debt financing and interest rates go back down, you go into other things, you know, but platforms to do that automatically would be ideal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, my, my, uh, Again, I think my, my, my belief is always this, right? Figure out how to solve a, a user's problem, right? With, with, the, with the things that are a bit more manual at first, right? Maybe it comes from curation and then understanding how um, that product works, bring on more, understand how that product works. And then eventually, you know, if you're able to kind of productize that automatically, I think that is the, that's the holy grail, right? Being able to have kind of an all weather, all kind of environment uh, guidance when it comes to portfolio allocation. Um, but yeah, not 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 too much that fits exactly this yet. But I think there are many different players that are making some kind of uh, progress in this place. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Thank you for sharing about that. That was very insightful, actually. Um, SRRs was the best way to reach you. So I've commented your LinkedIn in the chat. Um, if you want to share your email or anything, please feel free. Um, if there are no other questions, I have one last closing question for you. If there's a key takeaway from all of this, what would it be? One thing that you want all these people to go home and think about, what would it be? Um, I I, th I think that while investments is incredibly important and personal finance is incredibly per uh, important, but it is a very, very personal thing, right? Um, I think that a lot of this comes from 
I mean, really reflecting on what your own goals are and your own personal risk appetite as well, right? What works for one person might not work for the other person. And also in recognition of your, again, personality, right? I'm a buy and hold person. I'm not a short-term kind of quick gains uh, day trader type of person, right? I, I'm, I'm, that's not something that um, has worked out as much for me as, you know, just taking kind of certain long-term views of the market and, and, and taking a bet there. So um, yeah, take, take some time to basically figure that part out. Mm -hmm. And then the tools and the methods for getting there will come from, will come afterwards. Right. So um, that's maybe my one piece of advice that personal finance is very, very personal. Um, and uh, it's okay not to know the answers right away, but oh, it's a, it's a kind of a ongoing exercise that you have with yourself. Yeah, no, that was very insightful. Wow. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. I learned a lot today. I hope you guys did as well. I did not know what credit investing was before I came in, and now I'm really excited to go and try it out a little bit for myself. So yeah, thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing beautiful insights. Very true, very amazing. Um, yeah, and that's it for the session, guys. We'll see you next week.